<laughs> All right, on that note, good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Catherine Jenelson. I am the Mary and Dan Boone Curator of Folk and Self-Taught Art here at the High Museum of Art in Atlanta, where I'm not currently at the moment. Um, but I thank you for joining us. This exhibition that we're highlighting tonight is Really Free, The Radical Art of Nellie May Rowe, and it's organized by the High Museum of Art Atlanta. The High Museum of Art is pleased to acknowledge the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts for its generous support of this exhibition and publication. Major funding for the exhibition is also provided by Judith Alexander and Henry Alexander, the Judith Alexander Foundation and Troutman Pepper. Generous support for the national tour of this show is provided by the Art Bridges Foundation. The exhibition is made possible by Delta Airlines, Northside Hospital, uh, premier exhibition series supporters, Sarah and Jim Kennedy, Louise Sams and Jerome Griot, Dr. Joan H. Wien's estate, the Wish Foundation, the Benefactor Exhibition Series supporters are the Ann Cox Chambers Foundation, Robin and Hilton Howell. Uh, we also thank support from uh, the Ambassador Exhibition Series supporters, the Contributing Exhibition Series supporters, and our other generous supporters. And before I um, briefly introduce tonight's panelists, I want to thank all of the High Museum members who are in attendance. Your support is invaluable and fuels our mission. And if you're not yet a member of the High Museum or need to renew, please visit high.org at the end of this program. So I'm thrilled to be here tonight for this panel, The Power of the Playhouse, with my fellow panelists who are uh, Mr. Kenneth Brown, Mrs. Cheryl Mayshack, and Ms. Ruchi Mithal. Um, these are people who can offer really different perspectives than I can into the life and work of Nellie Mayro. Uh, Mr. Brown and Mrs. Meshack are relatives, the grand great-grandnephew and great-grandniece of Mrs. Nellie Mayro. And Ruchi is uh, one of the producer, or is the producer and a co-writer on a really exciting film that's coming out about, uh, about Nellie Mayro. And so we're going to hear from each of them. But before we do, I wanted to give um, our audience a little bit of uh, very the briefest of introductions into Nellie Mayro in case you don't know about her in this exhibition, and also speak a little bit about the Playhouse and give a little context for what the Playhouse was, which was it, it was an art environment, which is a really fabulous um, kind of production that many artists engage in, but that many people don't really recognize as art. So we'll talk a little bit about that to begin. If you would like to begin the slides, thank you. And thank you to my colleagues, Adira and Erin for um, facilitating this program and running our slides tonight. So this is the first gallery that you'll experience when you enter the exhibition, Really Free, The Radical Art of Nellie May Rowe. Um, and if you have not had the chance to visit, we hope you, that you will. It's going to be open until January 9th. Um, next slide. A little bit about Nellie Mae Rowe. She was somebody who knew she was an artist as a child. And this is a, one of the incredible drawings that's included in the show. The High has the leading collection of her work. At this point, more than 215 artworks in our collection by Nellie Mae Rowe. Thanks in large part to uh, a major gift from her friend and dealer, Judith Alexander, back in 2003. Um, but this is a wonderful example of the bright, complex, um, and, and very kind of deep in terms of their symbolism and narratives drawings that Nellie May Rowe made in the last 15 years of her life. Um, and what it's showing is this, this love that she had for art from the time that she was a little girl. So she's shown herself. Um, in kind of three different moments within this one drawing. Um, she's, she's kind of flying over um, across the, the, the drawing and pasting drawings that she made as a child on her wall. That was something that she did using a, a homemade paste that attracted rats. So she always got in trouble with her mother who you see down there um, kind of after punishing her is giving her a sweet fruit. Um, but Nellie Mayro didn't get to pursue art as her career path. She ended up marrying fairly young, moving to Vinings and working um, in the households of a, a kind of succession of white families ending with the Smiths who she worked for for decades. And it wasn't until both, well, she, so she was married um, once and then she remarried after her first husband passed away. And it wasn't until her second husband passed away and the Smiths were pa had passed away that she decided that it was time to start making art again. 
Um, and this is when she kind of declared in her life, her freedom, that she was really free and that she was an artist. Next slide. So it wasn't just drawings that she made. Um, she also made what I mentioned at the outset of the talk, which is this incredible thing called an art environment where she filled her home, which is captured in a photograph on the right and then shown in an incredible uh, kind of miniature form that um, Ruchi will talk about later in the panel. Uh, she made this whole space that she lived in, her yard, the interior of her home into a work of art by decorating it with everything that she had access to, um, mostly recycled materials and just turning it into a place of wonder. Next slide. So her home was not preserved after her death. And my understanding of the circumstances around that um, are that you know her, her husband, her second husband owned the home with her. And when she died, I think it went to his children. And I don't know that they were particularly interested in preserving you know, what Roe had made there. And also this was a time in 1982 is when she passed away where there wasn't this movement around art environments that we see today. So what I'm showing you on the screen are two different art environments in Georgia that have been preserved. St. Ohm's Passaquan on the left and Howard Finster's Paradise Garden on the right. And in both cases, these were places that were kind of valued by either family or members of the local community and preserved through kind of like private foundations um, so that they still exist today. And that didn't happen for either of these places until really the, the 90s. And so again, Roe kind of passed away at a time before there was this great value being placed on our environments and their potential to be preserved as sites of cultural heritage. Next slide. Today, there's this amazing museum that just opened in, in Sheboygan, Wisconsin called the Art Preserve, which is actually an art museum that's dedicated entirely to art environments. So please check that out. Uh, if you can make a trip out to Wisconsin, it's an unbelievable place that houses environments like what you see on the right is Emery Blagden's Sound Machine, because there are artists building these kinds of spectacular uh, places all around the country. And so this is a place where you can really appreciate the magnitude of what so many artists really dedicated their lives to in terms of building these total environments. Next slide. And you can find out more about art environments through spaces, which the website is right there in the upper left hand of your screen. And as you can see, you can kind of search for um, different locations all around the country that have art environments, both ones that still exist and ones that no longer exist, but you can see pictures, find out how to get to them. So there's, there's a, lot of, um, a, a lot of ways if you're interested in these kinds of places that you can experience art environments today. Next slide. And again, unfortunately, Rose art environment was not preserved, but we have a great video on our link website where uh, Destiny Fillmore, who's an incredible scholar who contributed to our catalog, gives you a little tour of the home site that Nellie Mayro once occupied. And so this is a video where she's explaining kind of the impact that visiting Roe's home site had on her own scholarship and writing around Roe. And what you're seeing on the screen is, is a still shot of the plaque uh, dedicated to Nellie Mayro that, that stands on a beautiful tree or just in front of a beautiful tree in Vinings today. So the, her home site is today occupied by the Indigo Hotel. And they've preserved a tree and, and created this beautiful plaque to commemorate that she once stood there in her incredible playhouse. And then even in their lobby, they also have a nice little display of photographs and a few of her works. So that's what I wanted to share with you just a little bit about her playhouse and the art environment um, that she you know, turned it into. But really the stars of the show tonight are um, Rose family and Ruchi. And so I wanna hand things over to Mr. Ken Brown to talk to us a little bit about his own memories of his aunt uh, and the impact that she made on him. Mr. Brown, take it away. Well, thank you, Katie. I'd like to thank you and thank the uh, High Museum for allowing me to be a part of this event. Uh, it's truly an honor. Um, I'll start out by saying this about Aunt Nellie. She, all I remember about her is that she was sweet and kind, okay? Uh, that was always whenever I saw her. But I'll start with talking about my earliest memories of her uh, was through her sister, my great-grandmother. Um, we would walk over from her house, I guess it was about a 15 minute walk from her house to Aunt Nellie's. 
And the walk was magnificent because at the time vinings was not developed. So it was like walking through this tunnel with this lush vegetation around. It was, it was, it was pretty cool. But I knew I was going to Aunt Nellie's house. So I knew when I got there, I was going to be able to grab a toy out of the tree, meaning like a truck, a Tonka toy truck, um, some type of car. I love cars. Uh, it was such a neat experience when I got to Aunt Nellie's house. So obviously the first thing I would do is look in the tree and find something to grab. Um, she had toys all over our yard, positioned in different places. The cool part about it for the time that, that I would make those journeys with Mar Brown was you never, she had so much, she had so much, you never played with the same toy twice. And the summers we were over a lot. Um, her yard was really cool. I can remember her out in her yard sweeping. Uh, no grass, it was just dirt and she was sweeping. You know, uh, she was always working on something. Uh, she had beautiful rose bushes along the fence. I don't know what you call the, the flowers that look like snowballs that were blue. She, she would be out, she'd be cutting those off and bringing them into her house. It was such a neat experience. It was like magic for a kid, five-year-old kid four-year-old kid, it was like an amusement park. Um, I can remember inside her house, every piece of her wall had something on it, be it her works or somebody else's she got from something, someone else. It was, it was a really neat experience. She was always, even Mar Brown, they were always making something. Um, the gallon milk jug type things back in the dinosaur days that we did milk out of. Yeah, th that, that was their go-to. They were always making something out of those. Uh, I can remember that um, waste baskets for our bedroom was made out of uh, egg cartons, the styrofoam egg cartons, and the bottom was a plate, paper plate of some sort. And she, she binded it all together with yarn. She was always creating something. Here you go, if you were playing in her yard and fell, her and Mar Brown always had this potion. Um, it was kerosene and salt in a mason jar. And if you scuffed yourself, they rub it on you. Hey, come here, honey, let me put this on you. And you, you were cured. Uh, if, the, if those two ladies were alive today, I bet they'd have a cure for COVID. <laughs> but anyway, at her place, it was always, you always felt love, joy. You were all smiling. I can never recall a, a visit at Aunt Nellie's home where you did not smile and laugh. And that was her. That was her. Um, I remember when Gramp, my grandfather, uh, got her her car. It was a 50, green 56 Chevrolet, I want to say. It's, it's a 5657. And it was on the column, three on the column. And she was and to see her driving it, it was pretty cool because she just didn't think of Aunt Nellie driving you know, for, for, for some odd reason. Uh, she was Aunt Nellie. She, she was just, you know, she was just chilling all the time. So I never thought of her driving. So it was pretty cool to see her driving it. And that was a neat experience for me as we grew it, it, uh, over time. Um, now, as I got older, obviously, into my early teens, I kind of drifted away. And when I say I drifted away, I didn't go completely away. I just didn't see her as much as I did as a kid. Um, you, you know, but I made a point a few times a year to stop by and visit her. She was that cool. I can, I can use that word to describe her. Um, she was definitely ahead of her time, okay? Uh, again, whatever I would, was doing at, as a teen, I would still make time to go see her. Uh, but not as much as I did as a as a as a kid. The magic was always there, no matter when you get, when you, when you would go visit her. I can remember one visit. I'm in high school at this point. My sister and I would go over. I want to say it was on a Saturday too. Now that I think about it, and um, we were sitting in her living room, and she said, uh, "Just out of nowhere, she says, what do you kids do with your gum when you finish chewing it?'" We didn't even have to answer. We're like, hey, we, she said, you throw it away, don't you? I said, yeah, you know, that's the that's the program. She says, not me. <laughs> she said, she showed us this tin can. She says, I take mine and I put it in this tin can and I take it and I put it in the freezer. And when I've got enough of it, I'll pull it out, I'll thaw it out and I'll pound it into shape. I'll make it into a shape and I'll make statues out of it. I remember me and my sister looked at each other and we just chuckled about it. And then they, they always said to me, she says, you play football, don't you? I said, yeah, Nelly. She says, I'm going to make a statue of you kicking a football. 
I never got that statue. I wish I did, though. But th that was a that was probably one of the most memorable memorable visits that I had with her as an adult. Um, so again, my my experience with her was it was always a joyous one. I never heard her say anything bad about anyone. Um, it was just always positive. It was always positive. Um, I'll go forward a little bit and I might be going a little too fast because I might have a little case of nerves, but this is cool to talk about her. Uh, I can remember as she got sick and she was, she knew she was going to be leaving. Um, she, my, my mom or my dad said, my, uh, Aunt Nelly wants you guys to come over and, and get some of her pieces, some of her, some of her artwork. And, uh, I went over, I went over and I talked with her. I sat with her and we talked. And she said, at the end, she says, go on, get some. I said, ain't Nellie, I didn't come over here to take anything. I just feel odd doing it. She goes, no, I want you to have it. And uh, I, I, no, no, ain't Nellie, you know, it's about you. I, 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 I just love you and, and uh, want to spend time with you. So, um, she left and I got no work. I'm cool. I was cool with that. Um, but about 30 years later, uh, Cheryl's sister, through Judith Alexander, was able to get send some pieces back to us. So I was fortunate later on to have some of her pieces, uh, which, again, knowing Aunt Nellie and being a part of her and knowing that she still, realistically, her blood is in me too, runs through me. Um, memories of her was she was her own person. She didn't care what people thought about her because she got, obviously before she was, we'll say discovered, uh, the kids at, at the elementary school I went to thought she was a witch. Uh, they used to, people would pick at her and, and it would, that would bother me and anger me. And I would obviously take up for, you know, I said, no, she's one of the sweetest people you'd ever meet. Uh, but she didn't care what people thought about her. She was her own person. Now, when I say that, I don't want I don't want you to think that she was. It was a cavalier attitude. It was a peaceful confidence that not many people have. But she did. She did. And um, I think. Well, not I think. I know that's what made her who she was and made her so cool at who she was because she was an individual. So I won't go into the, to detail. I won't get sidetracked to talking about that. But I will say this, that her life is a part of my journey, okay? It's made my life very interesting in a good way. Um, I'm proud to say that. Like her, I've never been into groups and, and belong to anything. Um, I just, like Aunt Nelly, I feel like I don't fit in anywhere. <laughs> um, but that's who I am, like Aunt Nellie, and I'm cool with that. That is truly, truly an Aunt Nellie characteristic. She was a beautiful person. Um, I'm very fortunate to have had her on my ride. I didn't want to talk too much about her leaving because as I was putting some things together, it kind of messed it me up uh, because, you know, uh, I remember her leaving and the funeral and, you know, I was a Paul Bear, Paul Bear at a funeral. So I want to talk about that. It kind of cracked. It, it, it messes me up. So um, again, to have known her was a really neat uh, experience. And unfortunately, I did not inherit any of her, any of her artistic qualities. <laughs> um, but boy, I sure enjoyed being connected to her and what she brought around us and how she made us feel, again, loved and, 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 and joyous and, and at peace whenever you were with, whenever you was with her. Uh, again, they came through America during a very interesting time, but that never, there was a confidence there. There was a confidence there of I'm not different. I'm me. Yeah, I'm not. There's nothing wrong with me. 
again, talking about people picking at her house and that's their problem, not hers. So I'm very fortunate. And I, again, that, that those qualities live within me today. And I'm just very fortunate to be a part of the Nellie Mae Rowe experience from, for, from a child, for as long as I can remember, up to the 22 years that I had her in my life when she left in 1982. She was beautiful, she was cool, and she was fun. And those are my memories of Aunt Nellie. And I'm so happy and proud to, uh, again, have her blood flowing through my veins. Katie, I'd like to thank you for letting me be a part of this event. All you other ladies, thank you so kindly. And uh, this has been a true, true honor. Thank you. It's, a, it's such an honor to have you be able to share those beautiful memories with us, Ken. And I, I, I did wanna make sure um, that you spoke a little to what's behind you, because I just wanna make sure people know that they're looking at your, your artworks by your aunt. Yes. What is the one on behind your right shoulder, I guess? What does well, that say? What is, what is yeah, your right that, on? Uh, Katie, thanks for asking. Um, that was a tribute to her sister, uh, Amy Eva. All of these, all of these women had these, this, these unique personalities. Um, Aunt Nellie was cool, but Amy Eva was a hipster. She dressed, she lived in town. She wore, you know, she dressed, uh, you know, really sharp and she was just a hipster. So that's uh, a, a tribute to her and uh, talking about where she was when she passed away. She was at Georgia Baptist uh, Hospital. It was on, uh, it looks like Monday, 15th, it says. So um, again, she created what she felt. You know, that was that happening at the moment. And I'm going to assume that was Aunt Nellie's hand though. Not, not, yeah, that's Aunt Nellie's hand. And this one, Katie is a dog. <laughs> this one on the on, on this side is a, is a dog of some sort. Um, and these were the pieces that I was that I that came back to us that Judith Alexander sent back to Kathy, Cheryl's sister, and Kathy made sure that we we got them. Um, so with me not wanting to feel like I was looting her house when she was passing, because I just. I had problems with that. I thought it would be tacky, honestly. Um, again, I, I was able to get what was mine in the end. So everything works itself out the way it's supposed to. I never, I never kicked myself for not taking anything. Uh, obviously, in ways that I wish I had of, but no, nah, I was okay. I was okay. And then I've got another one of her pieces over that hangs over my fireplace here. That that's my favorite one so it's kind of sits on display but she was a truly truly unique individual she did not belong she did she did not try to belong you know uh i can remember again as we were kids i, I thought we spent the night over at her house a couple of times but we didn't spend the night she baby she would babysit for us when 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 the folks were going out or something so i do remember being there at night so and the, and the place changed at night <laughs> the place took on a whole totally different energy at night, but it was still cool. It was, you were, you were, you, you were at peace and, you know, she had everything we needed. Obviously the toys, she loved TV. Like I love TV. We'd sit in front of the TV and just watch TV. And it was just a neat time, man. It was so, so cool. So that's why I say for me to be a part of this is really special because uh, how many people get to talk about a family member like this? So it, I'm very gracious. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. But yeah, I, I've got I, I've got a little bit of Aunt Nellie here in my place. <laughs> well, we've got questions bubbling up in the chat, but we're gonna we're gonna hold the questions until the end, just so our audience knows. But we'll definitely circle back um, just to prepare you. Some people want to see the work on your mantle, so oh. maybe later. We don't have to do it right now, but maybe if you can shift around at some point, if you want to share that. Okay. Um, but they would love to see that as well. But sure. for now, we'll 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 move on to our next panelists, um, your cousin, um, Cheryl Mayshack, and and invite um, invite Cheryl to come share some of her memories with us. And again, we'll take we'll come back to the questions at the end. So keep keep sending them into the chat. Thank you, everybody who has so far. Cheryl, it's great to have you here. Thank you. Great job, Ken. I don't know if I can. Go do, do what you do. Uh, you got this, son. You got this, sunshine. Carry on. <laughs> Katie, thank you. Thank the high for the opportunity. Um, 
I want to say good evening to all, and it is indeed a privilege and honor to speak to you about my Aunt Nellie. Okay, so for those of you who don't know much about her, I'll introduce you. And for those of you who do know her, I'll present her to you. So you might say, how can one introduce or present someone who is no longer here? But just if you give me a moment, I'm gonna make it all clear. You see, there's two words that come to mind that is eccentric and eclectic. Eccentric is usually defined as one who has unconventional and slightly strange behavior. And eclectic describes one who derives style or taste from a broad and diverse range of sources. So now, many of you knew Aunt Nelly personally and others might have been drawn to her through her art that she created. My aunt would be 121 years old if she was here today. And amazingly enough, we had the opportunity to know her very intimately. So as a child, as Kenny said, our afternoons were often filled with a trip to Vinings, Georgia on Paces Ferry Road to Aunt Nellie's home. And there the adventures began. Running through the yard that was adorned with every type of ornament and tchotchke you could imagine. The trees yielded fruit and art. The house was whimsically decorated with her creation of art and findings, along with pictures of the family and friends, Martin Luther King, JFK, and white Jesus. Gazing through this menagerie of sorts in a child's eyes was like playing the best video game ever. Some kids play Fortnite. We played Pac-Man, it was a video game. So not to mention Aunt Nellie had a very robust sound to her voice and her laughter. And when she spoke to the adults, you know, they would laugh and she would call our kids little varmints. We thought it was the funniest thing ever. As a matter of fact, she would have a contest with all of the children to determine which of us could write their name fancier than she. Now you probably already guessed by now that she was always the winner. And she would undoubtedly let us know that she was the best. Aunt Nellie had many siblings. And as Kenny said before, she had a sister called Minerva, who was Joe's mother. She was the midwife and the caretaker. Then there was Eva, who was the diva. And then there was Aunt Nellie, who was the artiste, as she called herself. And when they got together, it was better than watching the Golden Girls. These women were comedy at its best, and they were a force to be reckoned with. Aunt Nellie would let everyone know that when she was not sweeping her yard or not cleaning, her favorite pastime was WWF wrestling. And Thunderbolt Patterson was her favorite wrestler. And we all know that she brought his image to life through one of her paintings. And as the seasons changed and the weather started to become cold and brisk, I remember Michael Mayshack and Joe Brown and some of the others would bring her firewood to burn in her pot belly stove. Now, I don't know if any of you encountered that pot belly stove, but you knew that if you got too close to it, that was not an option. But she loved that fiery stove with the little coal pot sitting next to it to keep the fire burning. That was Aunt Nellie. There's a lot of stories that I can tell, but I can't tell them all. But I can tell you that the eccentricity of her behavior was normal to us. And it was the utmost expression of who she was as well as the eclectic nature of her appearance and demeanor that set her apart and ahead of her time. I remember I was told that when Aunt Nellie came to New York to a show, 
they went to a high-end department store, you know, to style her and get her all prettied up for the show. And when it was time for the show, they picked up Aunt Nelly and Aunt Nelly had styled herself. So all of the stuff that they bought at the high-end show, Aunt Nelly said, well, you know what? I'm going to make my own little style. And that's who she was. Although Aunt Nelly never bore any children, my grandfather, Joe Brown Sr., played a major role in her life and in her care. And she loved him. She never, ever, ever made any decisions without his approval. And I said all of that to say that her gregarious personality resounded so much in her community and the public was so intrigued by her and her artistic creations. So much so, Aunt Nellie had her own gallery of sorts because people would stop by her home and sign her guest book and take photographs with the presiding artist. Not all people, as Kenny said before, loved Aunt Nellie's art. And some thought she was a, witch, a witchcraft person, a voodoo woman, but little did they know this was far from the truth. And as God so graciously ordained, divine intervention took place and Judith Alexander met Nellie Mae Rowe. The cosmos lined up the stars for this union of two people who were so different, but very much alike to me. Judith being a love of art was enamored with Nellie's work and thus began the journey of the two of them becoming lifelong friends. They explored the world of art and society together. And their quirkiness brought out the genius attributes in the both of them. An observation as to how these two navigated was very, very comical. I can't emphasize enough to you guys how they were the yin to the other's yang. And because of this, they had a wonderful working and personal relationship. And if there were any discrepancies, they will always refer back to my grandfather, Joe Brown Sr. for the final decision. Judith became family and she loved Joe just as much as, as Nellie did. And she would often say in her Judith's voice, Joe, what do you think about this? What do you want us to do? And he would laugh and he would put his little two cents in, but they valued his opinion. And I remember when Aunt Nellie's health began to fail, she had won the Bronze Jubilee Award and Judith made sure that Joe was there to accept the award on her behalf. And Aunt Nellie would tell my sister and I often, we went to see her and one day she, she said, I'm gonna become a, a famous artiste because people really enjoy my pictures as she called it. And then she said, mark my word. Now come on here and take one of these pictures with you. So I just wanna say because of Judith's unyielding desire to share Aunt Nellie's art with the world, here we are today, remembering Nellie Mae Rowe. However, we cannot remember Nellie in this capacity without remembering Judith Alexander as well. These two polar forces have left an indelible imprint on our lives as we gather some 30 odd years after Nellie's death. With the world in crisis and turmoil right now, let us gather some pointers from these two women and how to maneuver in a world that is not so kind with love and togetherness. Nellie believed that with God first in her life, this was possible and it showed. My family thanks Judith for helping make Aunt Nellie's artistic dreams come true. And thank you Aunt Nellie for loving me and the family and leaving us with an exemplary blueprint in which to follow. We will remember you and Judith for generations to come. Thank you. Oh my goodness, thank you, Cheryl. That was beautiful. <laughs> thank you for sharing this gorgeous image of you um, uh, coming 
face to face again with your aunt in our in our exhibition. This was just taken on Saturday, um, which was a very special evening when we were all together. Um, and I'm just so grateful that that we could be together, um, especially in this tumultuous time, as you say. Um, so thank you. We're going to come back to you at the end. Um, I know. And I want to. Um, yeah, just I can't I can't express how much uh, your personal memories and Ken's personal memories just add a, just a layer of, of depth and dimension to our understanding of, of Nelly as an artist and as a person. Um, nobody can really speak to that the way that you all can. So thank you so much, both of you. Um, uh, and, and then next we have uh, another wonderful panelist, Ruchi Mithil, who is going to speak to us about an incredible project she's been working on for a number of years uh, with the crew, her collaborators um, at Open Docs, which is a, a, a documentary making firm that's based in New York. And they have become uh, really wonderful interlocutors for me. Uh, they've been working on their film about as long as I've been at the high. And we've kind of gone back and forth over the years as I've developed this show and they're working on their film. And wonderfully, the exhibition actually includes uh, these incredible reimaginings of Nellie Mayro's Playhouse that, that Ruchi will speak a little bit about. Um, but we're so grateful to Ruchi and um, Petra Ringbaum, who's the director of the film, and all of her um, incredible co-workers over at Open Docs who have really just brought a new layer of experience to, to our exhibition. So Ruchi, um, Ruchi is also a catalog contributor. So if you haven't seen the book um, that we produced for, for this exhibition, please check it out. We'll, we'll put a link to it in the chat, but Ruchi wrote an incredible essay for the catalog as well about her process as a filmmaker. So I'm gonna hand things over to you. Thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you so much. I mean, just hearing from um, Ken and Cheryl, like the fact that I am here in this company getting to speak about this incredible woman and incredible artist um, is just such a privilege and honor and just one of those amazing things, like how did I get here, you know? Um, so thank you to both members of um, Nellie Ray Rose family who are here and also Katie, who's done such incredible work and scholarship and, and helped make this incredible exhibition happen of her work. Um, and, you know, for putting that into the world for people to experience and then for allowing our film to be a small part of it um, is just tremendous. Um, so, you know, and I also wanted to say um, thank you, you know, to the Judith Alexander Foundation, which is comprised of members of both Judith Alexander and Nellie Mae Rose families, which is kind of amazing to think about. Um, they were really the catalyst for how this film came into being and really trusted um, Petter and myself and our team to make something um, both with their support and of our own vision. So thank you for that. Um, you know, I mean, a little bit about me is just, you know, I've been making documentaries for about 10 years now. And one of the reasons that I love documentary so much is because I think real life is much stranger and <laughs> wilder and more interesting than anything I could ever invent. And certainly that is the case, um, you know, with this film and, you know, the, you know, people often ask me, what types of documentaries do you work on? And I'm like, that's the best part. There is no type. I mean, each one has been as different from each other as you can imagine. There's a high school football team in West Philadelphia, um, you know, a series about mental health that I did recently, uh, a wrongful conviction case. But this is my second film about an artist because I am obsessed with people who make things. I want to know what it's about. I want to know where it comes from. I think there's nothing more fascinating um, than those people in the world who are compelled to make and then make us consider what it is they've shared. Um, so when the director of this film, Petter Ringbaum, um, came to me, we, we had this shared love of um, art and artists and a shared curiosity about it. And I think curiosity is really important to this process because um, if you think about, you know, the typical documentaries that you see about a person, 
um, an artist or a musician or whoever it may be, um, you typically have, um, you know, resources like lots of photographs about them. You might have the person themselves who's able to speak about their life. You have scores of people who knew them. You know, you might have a, a university archive and letters and all kinds of things. And, you know, one of the things when we embarked upon this project that was um, a creative challenge, but ultimately I think led us to a real creative opportunity is that, you know, the truth is that um, there are not, you know, given who Nellie Mae Rowe was and the times that she was living and where she lived as a female Black self-taught artist in the South, like she didn't get the same sort of level of um, photography and films made about her and the, the typical resources that you might think of that would support making a documentary. And so thought to ourselves, like, how can we really honor the spirit of this artist? And how can we tell the story um, without all of the, you know, without hundreds of photographs, without films? How, how do we do this in a way that is also not just other people telling us what her work is about, but allowing people to experience it. You know, like, I, I don't wanna sit here and tell you what it means. I think we've, a lot of us here have talked about how the artist herself resisted meaning or had meaning that changed over time. Um, so we didn't wanna be in the business of telling you this is what it is and um, this is what to think. We want you to experience it and have a feeling of being moved. Um, so what we hit upon, we're like, you know what? Nellie Mae Rowe made a playhouse. I think she's giving us permission also to play. She made art out of whatever was available to her and whatever she could find. So in her spirit, we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna make something about something with whatever is available to us. And let's put our imagination to the task in the same way that she did in her spirit and with her permission. Um, which I hope we have, Nellie. I think she would like this. So um, what we thought about was, you know, we could never recreate her playhouse, um, nor would we want to, but we could try and reimagine it. And we could do so with a spirit of fidelity, but also playfulness. And so you can see here some images of the exterior set that we created in concert with, um, some fantastic artists who did the actual building. And, you know, this is a documentary. It is based in um, the reality of the photographs that we have um, of the Playhouse, but also the memories of the family members who shared with us what the space felt like, the objects that they saw there, um, the dimensions of the rooms, you know, we took the the material that we had, which is people's recollections and photographs and impressions, and then put that towards trying to reimagine this space. Um, and so you can see, you know, kind of this movie magic that happens when you look at this picture, there's her house, but you can also see like, that thing fits on a tabletop. Um, and it really was kind of a magical experience to be able to create both this exterior and then interiors um, of her playhouse as well, which are, you'll see in some other photos, you know, the perfect size for a four-year-old, for example, or like one third life. And I have to say, being at the museum with you all, Ken and Cheryl, and seeing you and your mom, you know, Roberta, actually looking into our sets of the space that you had actually been in, in real life was like, just so moving and um, just like really profound, you know, because I think that, you know, someone said to me recently, like, if you are moved, you will move. This is her bedroom. Um, uh, and I feel like Nellie Mae Rowe through her art moved us and we were moved to create something else. And I think that is so beautiful. A new work of art is being born because of the force of her art that she made. Um, so, you know, in addition to the sets that you see here, we wanted um, folks to get to have an experience of meeting Nellie Mae Rowe and her friend and supporter and gallerist, Judith Alexander. So we came upon this idea of these very handmade sets, also in the spirit of Nellie Mae Rowe, who made 
her work with her hands um, with 3D animation characters. All right, you're gonna have to follow me on this. This is a little complicated, but we had real life actors, um, Uzo Aduba and Amy Warren um, perform the parts of Nellie Mayro and Judith Alexander. And then through this motion capture technology where there, you saw Uzo wearing this helmet, recorded their voices, their facial expressions, their body movements. And those were then transposed into a 3D animation. So you have all these layers of, you know, performance and creation coming together. Um, and all of the dialogue, you know, of course, we did not have the pleasure of actually getting to sit down and speaking to Nellie May Rowe, but all of the dialogue that is spoken um, by the animated characters is based on quotes um, or written materials or interviews that we had. So while we certainly have taken the liberty of reimagining her space, we kept her words grounded in the words that she was known to have said. Um, and, you know, I mean, just telling you, you can see like, you know, Petter is a life-size human and this is him filming um, the inside of her bedroom. Um, it was really amazing to sort of be able to have different times of day, you know, we had, uh, thunder and lightning outside for certain parts. And um, she just had created such a rich visual environment that it really allowed us to go crazy with it and, um, and recreate it in this way. And, um, you know, just some of these details that you can see, I mean, that fan that one of the artists is, is working on, it actually blows air out of it and it's made out of cardboard. Um, we had um, the little bottles that you saw on the exterior on her bottle tree are real little bottles like made out of sugar water. Um, you know, one of the trees is actually made out of popcorn. That's like my, my favorite part of the whole thing, the popcorn tree. Um, you know, we have that fan actually works as well. Um, so it was just really like, I think loving, whimsical, and true uh, as much as like a reimagining is true. And here, um, I think Cheryl talked about um, Nellie Nero's love of wrestling, in particular, uh, the wrestler Thunderbolt Patterson. So you can see how we were able to mix this like cardboard um, TV with like the real footage that you'll see of the wrestling. So it really like brings it to life, I think, in a way. Um, that we hope will just be immersive for people that you'll get to just be in Nellie May Rose, eclectic, eccentric, you know, fantastical um, world that is maybe more beautiful than the one that we inhabit every day. And this is just us like loving up on watching the performance happen. Like, you know, we're just so excited to watch this come to life and to hear Nellie May Rose words um, come to life. That's Petter on the left. And, um, yeah, you know, this film is, uh, you know, the parts that you're seeing, the sets and the playhouse and the animations are a smaller part of a larger film um, that also include interviews with folks. In fact, the folks, all three of the other panelists you see here are included and contributed a lot. Other family members, historians, um, you know, uh, uh, family members of Judith Alexander's as well. And, um, animations of, of Nellie May Rowe's artwork that also served to bring it to life, I think. Um, all of these live together in this film, but you know, the, the playhouse and sort of unlocking the way to approach the playhouse, I think really opened up this vast field of creativity for the film. Um, and I hope uh, that it is the film that Nellie May Rowe deserves. Um, I hope it's one that, you know, might raise more questions than it answers. And that allows people to just play in the space and um, have their own experience of it. Thank you so much, Ruchi. And I just shared a link um, to your all's website where you have a little bit about the film up. And just for people to know, this is this film has not yet been released. Um, that is hopefully coming next year. 
Um, and, and we hope that you'll have an opportunity for those of you who are with us tonight who are in Atlanta to, you know, see it through the high at some point. Currently in the, in the actual exhibition, you are able to experience a short film that Open Docs cut for us where you can kind of see the sets come alive as they do um, in, in the feature length documentary. And you also get to see those sets uh, in person. So that's, um, that's something really rich that you can experience actually in the galleries right now, even though the film has not yet even been released. So we're so grateful to Open Docs for, um, for, for working with us on that. And uh, just one last slide that I wanted to show Aaron before we start taking questions um, was to invite you all you know, not only to experience Nellie Mayro's incredible artwork and Open Docs' amazing work on the film and the sets, um, but there is uh, one other thing that I wanted to invite you all to do, and we may not be able to show the slide, but, you know, experiencing Rose Playhouse was, was something that so many people got to do. There were literally hundreds, maybe even more than a thousand people who visited her. Um, and so, uh, we wanted to invite you to sign the guest books um, when you do come to the exhibition. And before uh, we take questions, I did just also want to hand the mic back over to Cheryl um, so that she is able to share with us something that she's written because Cheryl is also an artist, as I'm sure you could tell by the way that she spoke before. Um, and she has something that she's prepared that she wanted to, um, to share with us this evening. So Cheryl. It's back to you now. Okay. This piece is a spoken word called free. And I tried to keep it in line with the theme of what you guys are, are doing with the show. So here we go. In 1900, a little black girl came into the world on July 4th, Independence Day, if you please, with an innate yearning to be free free to create a whimsical world that belonged to the vision within her reach, simply doodling without a care in the world, but simplicity to her was not free. You see, the perils of this world being tossed and hurled was like the arrow Paris drew that hit Achilles' feet. The melodies from heaven played in her head far exceeded the 20th century, and she danced to the beat of a different drum that stemmed from the lineage of her African ancestry. Martin King, Malcolm X, Shirley Chisholm, Angela Davis, and Kennedy were all a part of the movement and the struggle to be free. But in Nellie's mind, she was free, free from the bondage that the oppressors dictated it to be. Because as a little girl, her imaginative world was to create things that would bring her peace. Like the Dahomey women warriors, fierce and strong, Nellie was daring and daunting as could be, coloring her palette each day on the pathway to becoming free. Jesus was the center of her joy as she believed. I lift up my hands in total praise to the freedom God gave was often a part of her imagery. She was demonstrative about the goodness of God and was always ready to express it to her friends and family. A rare gem was she, a beacon of light shining, nestled in a little cove in vinings, waiting for the world to see her brilliance and gifts of her creative imagination and artistry that was bursting at the seams, exclaiming how to have peace and be free. And I can hear Aunt Nelly sing. Traveling down, Lord, through this wilderness below, guide my feet in peaceful ways. Turn my night into day. I do not know how long it will be, nor what the future holds for me. But this I know, if Jesus leads me, I shall be free, free, free someday, really free. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. That was 
beyond. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, if I could snap, this was embarrassing. I had never learned how to snap, but I would be big time snaps for you. That was absolutely gorgeous. You are an artist too. Um, thank you. And on that note, everybody can be an artist because if you do come to the exhibition, we hope you will, as I think every single one of our panelists already has, <laughs> signed our, sign our guest book. Because as I was saying before, you know, Nellie Mayro kept, kept guest books that where people recorded not just their names and where they came from, but just how much she had an impact on their lives. People drew for her. They talked about um, how she was just like nobody they'd ever met before in their lives. Um, you know, her spirit was so strong and that's recorded in all of these entries from the 1970s. But what we're trying to do is to kind of bring that into the 21st century, keeping her legacy alive, inspiring people to leave messages um, about how her work is still impacting them. Um, and so thank you uh, for all of you who can make it to the exhibition. Thank you in advance for signing our guest books. This is something that we're going to put online. It's all going to be part of our link project that I showed you before. Um, so you'll be able to visit your entries uh, someday when they come up online. We we'll hope you will all come to the show. Um, and I'm going to look back through the chat at some questions that I saw come up. But please feel free to keep adding to, um, to the chat with your questions. But thank you again, panelists. This was just a really moving evening to share with you uh, what an incredible family she had and how excited I am to see uh, the film This World Is On My Own someday when it comes out from Open Docs. I'm so excited um, to, see, to see your finished product. It's, it, I know it's been a, an incredible journey for you all too. So I saw a, chat, a question early on um, when Ken was speaking that I, I thought was great about, you know, where did you think that... Um, your aunt Nellie and her sisters got this incredible independent spirit that you all have spoken so much to. So I think it's a question for, for both Ken and Cheryl. Wow, that's just such a heavy, um, again, especially during the time that they were existing, they were just so, so strong. They were just so, so strong-willed people. Um, that's a hard question for me to answer because they moved they moved by their own their own beat they, they they again not discounting anyone else but it's all about individuality and those ladies had it um i can't answer that question i wish i could and honestly katie i have to say it again i'm so thankful that i have their blood running through me because i'm that way as well it, it leads to somewhat of a lonely life but a happy life because you're not trying to conform. I just, I just never liked them. I just really never wanted to belong to anything. It's kind of weird, isn't it? Not weird. It's not weird. No, it's not weird at all. I think. I, I look. I think the way they looked at it is their fingerprint is unique to you. I think most people are constantly striving for validation and, and and acceptance from other people. Which again, there's nothing wrong with that, but. I feel like they felt you got to accept yourself first, and and Aunt Nellie was living proof of that, and and Ma Brown was just as abstract as she was. So yeah, it was all it's all about self love. That's and and that's where I got it from. I'm sure. Uh, talking about the times uh, when I started elementary school, I mean, I knew I was a, a, a black kid, but I didn't know that it was it was a detriment because it was never talked to me. Nobody ever brought it to my attention. It was kind of a shock when the other kid, when these kids, when these white kids were so brutally mean to me. I'm like, what's wrong with you? Because there's nothing wrong with me. So th that's where I got it from. And I was I'm very grateful to come from those people. Uh, the Ma Browns, the Aunt Nellies, the Gramps, the Uncle Pauls, you know, I have to talk about all of them because the, it, it, take, it, it took all of them to make us who we are. So is I'm Ma, very grateful. Is Ma Brown your grandmother? Is that that was that was my grandfather's mother? Yeah. Oh, mother. Okay. My, that's Aunt Nellie's sister. Aunt Nellie's sister. Okay. So yeah, yeah. It was just really. It was. It was an interesting. It, it, the, again, I talk about the journey. It's been very interesting. Uh, those people, the Aunt Nellies, the Ma Browns, made me who I am today. Yes. And I think I do. I think I'm okay. 
<laughs> yeah, we think you're pretty great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Gerald, do you have anything to say about the independent spirit that you? I yeah. actually, I actually believe that um, because Aunt Nellie was true to herself. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Just as Ken said, Aunt Nellie was 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 true to herself. She never tried to be anybody else. Ma Brown was true to herself. She never tried to be anyone else. Um, Aunt Eva was definitely true to herself. So I think that um, I don't know if it was because of the way they grew up or the time that they came through, but I think that they had to gather strength from something. And, you know, Aunt Nellie's was, uh, her strong belief was in God. So I think she always expressed that. She always talked about God. You see it in all of her imagery. You, you see her hands always raised, or she'll say, I think the Lord, she might spell it wrong, but you know what she's trying to, to, to convey. So, you know, as Kenny was saying, my Brown made medicine. You know, so, you know, when we, when we were young, I remember her making medicine, you know. Well, I, I, had was, asthma. I, I had asthma as a child and she cut, cut a limb off of some, or some type of tree yes. that it measured it to my height and she put it yes. over my bedroom door and she said, when you outgrow this, you won't have asthma. Yes. I hadn't weaved yes. it ever since. And I, and I, you know, so, but again, they, they were very unique, very unique yes. people. Um, yes. extremely beautiful yes. yeah so yes. where they got that from I, I don't know where they got it from but I'm glad they had it <laughs> yes. I didn't mean to cut you off but I had to yeah, jump in there no you had to interject that's okay that's okay and Aunt Eva I think was the first of them and if you know what Kathy might know this and she might unmute herself but I think Aunt Eva was the first to go to college um, out of all of them so um, I think she went to Spelman College, uh, if Kathy can unmute herself and, and confirm that. So they all had different strengths. If you, if you want to hear from different crazy, places. not to cut you off again, I'm sitting with Graham years later, I'm 40 years old, I'm sitting with him. He said, did you know Mar Brown couldn't read? I'm like, what? Because she would always read the Bible to you. And, okay. You know what? I, I just then, said that to then my Then I didn't put two and two together. She'd bring her mail over and say, hey, read my mail. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Crazy. Yes. Crazy. I said I said to my mom just last week, I said, how could she not read, but she read the Bible? And I know she read the Bible because she read she the Bible. Read it to you. And it was not through memory. She would open it to whatever chapter or whatever uh -huh. verse, and she would read the Bible to you. So I was like, how could she not read, but she read the Bible? That was really weird. Yeah, and, and it, it freaked me out. I, I, when I thought about it, I'm like, yeah, you know, you're right. Yeah, it's, it's the, again, the journey was was so special and wonderful. Um, again, as a child, I was so fortunate to have Aunt Nellie's yard. <laughs> like I said, you know, it was so filled with toys and the, the lineup was so strong. You did not, as, and we'd be over there all summer long, you would not play with the same toy twice. Uh, yeah, so it was just really a neat experience, man. It's I, I was very fortunate. And, and Katie, again, I can't thank you enough for giving me the opportunity to even talk about it. I mean, the pleasure and is you know, ours. Katie, and we are so lucky Katie, to have you on here, Katie, I think that one of the main things that stands out to me was that she loved people. Yeah. And she invited people into her, her yard, her playhouse, and her home. And to me, I think that that's the key that goes beyond anything else was the love that she had, the love that she shared with everybody. You know, Cheryl, I mean, you know, is that if she started, is that she started letting people into her house? You know, again, I was I was protective of her in a in a different way. I was concerned that somebody might come into her because she let anybody. In. She yes. Let anybody. Right? Somebody driving down Pages Ferry. Hey, we just want to come to your house and like, huh? Don't you know these people think something's wrong with you and you didn't invite them into your house, but they let you go? Know that she was protected. You know, the universe was looking after. Yeah, it's, it's crazy when you look back on it and think about it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's a big part of what 
you know, inspired me to think about her art as a radical practice, right? That she, that she was doing that, that she was living alone, you know, as a black yeah. woman herself in this time, yeah. after what she'd been through in her life and what she'd seen go down, you know, in her life. And I just, I think that that was so incredibly courageous, you know, and it's, it's what we today call like social practice art, where you're trying to bring in your community, you know, and create change and create inspiration by actually interacting with people and using your art as a kind of medium for that. But that's, you know, she was like you said, I think Ken, or maybe Cheryl, you said it too, but she was so ahead of her time. I mean, she was just so ahead of her time and so, so brave um, for not, you know, letting that fear of what could happen stand in her way. But I understand why you might've been afraid for her, Ken. I mean, that's- Yeah, it was a, it was a crazy, thing. crazy time. Yeah, yeah. But she would let people in her house, somebody driving on page there. We need to see your house. We just want to come inside. I'm like, I think I mentioned to daddy once. I said, I'm afraid she's going to get hurt. But yeah, she's letting people in her house. And she, but that, again, that, that, that speaks to the quiet strength that she had as a, as a person. Yeah, she had no fears. Yeah. And neither did Mar Brown. That's kind of strange that you think about that, too. Yeah. They were, they were really unique people. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, they were the Dahomey women warriors. Yeah. You never saw, never yeah. saw either one of them in pants. <laughs> they did not wear <laughs> pants. Yeah. Be out in the yard working. Mar Brown, both of them be out in the yard working. Ain't Nelly, she's digging something up in a dress. Yeah. I thought that was weird as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. I thought that was weird as a kid. It's like, why don't you put on some jeans or something? And she's out working in the yard. Yeah, yeah. So interesting. But 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 I thank you for again giving me the opportunity because as thank I start you. thinking about what you asked me to do, all these memories just started coming back to. Yeah, and you know, over the years, I've I've lost the memory, but boy, it felt good to to well, stroll backwards. Yeah. It's great, you know, because this, this has been recorded and it's going to be part of that website. I keep talking about our link website, which is our new platform for our different collection and exhibition projects. And so people will be able to refer back to this. And so this is all adding to her legacy, right? It's everything that, that you said here tonight. So, and then obviously you're also in the film. So there will be that dimension of your, of your memories too, for, for future generations. So we just thank you. I, I didn't, um, I, I think most of what's been expressed in the chat, we have to cut and paste it for you all because everybody just is so grateful to you um, and just expressing so much love for what you've shared tonight and excitement about the documentary. There's just so much enthusiasm in this chat. I did not see a lot of questions. So unless I, I missed something, if somebody wouldn't mind re-asking it or if there are any final questions um, that we have this evening, I'll give a moment for those to bubble up in the chat. Um, and also invite anybody on the panel if anyone has a question for another panelist. But we might be, I think you all just kind of knocked, pe knocked people's socks off tonight. <laughs> and they're just kind of recovering. Thank you, all. Yeah. Thank you for the work that you've done is to, you know, to look at the house and the, the, the inside is amazingly, you know, as I saw it Saturday night, the green sofa. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I'll never forget it. I'll, yeah, 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 I'll never forget it, yeah. Yeah, so it's just, this has been beautiful. Thank you. Well, somebody did just ask, did Nelly have a favorite artist? I do believe it oh. was Mahalia Jackson. Uh oh, you mean recording artist? Yes, oh. I believe it was Mahalia Jackson. It definitely Jackson. Be Mahalia Jackson, yeah. Right, and she did make a work about a Mahalia Jackson, or Mahalia, Mahalia Jackson, sorry, uh, song um, that's yeah. in the exhibition, Look Back and Wonder, How I Got Over. I mean, it wasn't oh, okay. written by her, but but made made very popular by her um but was there a visual artist yeah it seems like this person was wanting to know about if there was like a painter or that she knew about or anything um did anybody remember her liking any painters or visual artists i mean i what i heard is that when when judith took her to the high in around like 1978 1979 um she was like, she, you know, she liked what she saw that at that point, the collection was, was really European and American, um, you know, a lot of historical art, but that she wasn't that impressed. That was, that was how the memory of that visit was recorded. was that she, when, she you that, that, when you, when you ask that question, did she have a, fav, fav, a favorite artist? I said her. Yeah. 
Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, again, there, there, there's that self-love thing that I was talking about. I was going to say, let us all feel that way about ourselves. I know. What a statement. I yeah. love that. Here we go again. Ain't Nelly loved Ain't Nelly. <laughs> and she should have. <laughs> ain't Nelly loved Ain't Nelly. And I, 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 yeah, she should. Yeah. So, <laughs> no, and plus, you know, again, the, the education wasn't there to what other artists, you know? I mean, what what yeah. artists could she relate to? You know, it's, you know, I mean, Salvador Dali was painting at the time, but she didn't know nothing about him, Salvador Dali. You didn't, you didn't have a hundred TV channels on TV where you could find stuff. You had three TV stations. You had Channel 3, Channel 5, and Channel 11. And they didn't have Andy Warhol on there for it. They'd be like, hey, there's Andy Warhol. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> it, was just, it was all, it was, yeah. It was her little private Idaho. <laughs> her all personal gallery. Yeah. yeah. Her all personal gallery. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody um, else asked about, oh, sorry. Did you want to speak to that, Cheryl? No, I think someone asked, how did Judith and oh. Nellie meet? Yeah. Do you want to answer that? Or I, I can give my answer, but. Give your answer. All right. My answer is what I read in, in a paper that Judith told the AJCA, I believe at some point, that even though she knew, she knew about Nellie Mayrose's work, at least from 1976, which was when Nellie Mayrose's work was first exhibited in an art exhibition called Missing Pieces at the um, Atlanta History Center. Um, so she at least knew about Nellie's work from that time in 1976. She might have known about it earlier because some of her family members knew about Nellie and were taking pictures of Nellie Mayrose um, starting in 1971. But it wasn't until 1978 when Nellie Mae Rose dolls, um, because she made drawings and bubble gum or chewing gum sculptures, which we've heard a bit about, and dolls. Dolls were a big part of her practice. And some of her dolls were included in a show at the Nexus Artists Cooperative, which you know, is today Atlanta Contemporary. And it was at that show that Judith experienced that show. And she said, wow, like this is an amazing artist I need. I need to form a relationship with this person. And then she did. And then as you've heard from Cheryl, I mean, it was like a match made in a bizarre heaven, <laughs> like just yin and yang fitting together. And so then they became, you know, super fast friends and colleagues because Judas gave her her first show that same year at her Atlanta art gallery. And, um, and, you know, something you said, Cheryl, at the, at, at Judas funeral, I believe um, I read was about how, uh, they formed a beautiful quilt together. Um, they their their fates kind of became stitched together, such that you know Judith changed Nellie May Rowe's life by making her known as an artist, but Nellie May Rowe changed Judith's life because she really became the primary artist that Judith would focus on in her subsequent decades as a gallerist. It was really Nellie May Rowe who Judith was so passionate about and beat the drum for you know, up until her own death in 2005, essentially. I mean, she was really all about making sure the world knew about Nellie, including giving the high its major collection of Nellie Mayra's work so that, you know, she would be seen. Um, so that's that's kind of my, my story about it. But I don't know if anybody has anything else to add, including anyone else in the audience. Okay. All right. Well, I think we do have to wrap things up because we've gone over a bit. We want to respect our our panelists' time unless there's any last words that anybody wants to throw out there. Well, thank you all. Um, and then Yadira and Aaron, who are running this program, thank you both so much. And please, if we can find a way to save this chat, I think it would be really, really great. So let's not end the program until we save the chat um, because we want to, I want to circulate this to all y'all because it's really lovely what people, what people have said. And I want to make sure you, you get to see it if you didn't have a chance to read it. So thank you everyone for attending tonight. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Ruchi. Um, thank you all the people who are in the audience who are also family, who are also foundation board members, who are part of Open Docs, who are part of everything we talked about tonight. Um, we're so grateful to you all and, um, you know, just feeling filled with filled with joy um, for for celebrating Nellie. So thank you all. Okay. Thank you so much. You guys stay safe. Have a wonderful evening. Take care. Take care.